Do we have an, uh, another question, Ralph? So how is the book of Job the oldest in the Bible? Hmm. All right, go to the book of Job. Next question. <laughs> I'm trying to think how I can answer that one. So we'll go to the book of Job. All right. Let me erase this. All right, we're going to look at the book of Job, and we're going to find out how we know that this is the oldest book in the Bible. All right, let's look at the book of Job. Now, notice uh, the region where he lived, okay? We're going to look at Job chapter 1. <clears throat> look at his time period. There was a man, verse 1, there was a man in the land of where? Uz, whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright and one that feared God. Uh, and there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she asses in a very great household. So that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. <clears throat> uh, notice also that we're going to look at Genesis chapter 10, verse 23 as well. Let's compare that term with us, right? So Genesis chapter 10, verse 23. All right, so Dr. Ruckman, what he wrote in his reference Bible is that he will compare the terms over here with the land of us that it was named after a son of Aram, actually, who was the son of Shem. So notice right here that this will be during the Abrahamic timeline. See that? That'll be during the Abrahamic timeline then. Notice right here, Genesis 10, verse 23, and the children of Aram, notice who? Uz, Uz and Hol, and Gether, and uh, Mash. So notice right here where Job lived was a land named after Aram. Now, uh, Dr. Ruckman also wrote here in his notes that this land is plainly Idumea in the land of Edom. And that would be compared with, I, you know, I didn't write a single thing over here. So let me start off one by one over here. So first clue is Job 1.1. 1, 1. You start off with the beginning. Notice that it was in the land of us. Now this term, what you'll notice is that it's an ancient term. That's how we can tell how old it is. Because during the timeline when we reach later on in the nation of Israel, that term is no longer used. This was translated into a region in Idumea, which is where? During the timeline uh, where Isaiah mentions it. So we know that this has to be older than that, all right? Not only that, how we know that this is definitely old as well is that this is talking about Job here being God's people. Located at the east. So th notice that his people, as I read at verses 2, 3, and onward, it's a tribal group. Now you notice the similarity here. The similarity is that it was nomadic and it was tribal. It was not the own, your own people called Israel that time. As a matter of fact, see if you can find the word Israel or Jew in there at the book of Job. So that's why we know that this is going to be what? Older than Moses. This is also going to be older than Jacob, who started the nation of Israel. Okay, let's compare scripture with scripture. If it's a tribal group, what time period would it be contemporary with? Well, we looked at Genesis chapter 10, right? So it's got to be during that time when everybody was spreading out with different, different tribal groups. So comparing that with Genesis chapter 10, then we know the timeline is during the timeline of Abraham. It's sometime between the timeline of Abraham and Shem. Why? Because of Genesis chapter 10, we saw that verse 23. 
Abraham, he was known as to be a nomadic tribal group as well. See that? So there's no doubt that Job was during that timeline. Okay, why Job is the oldest book in your Bible? Pretty simple. Because who's the one that wrote the first books in your Bible? Yeah, yeah, you're using your head. So when we think about Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, even Jewish scholars today, so I'm not quoting Christian, I'm quoting Jewish scholars who know their, their Torah and who know their sources and their history. They believe that Moses was the author of these books. If Moses is the author of the first book in your Bible, Genesis, and Jacob was before, uh, not Jacob, Job was before Moses, then that makes Job's book what? The oldest. So his book would be the oldest book in your Bible. <clears throat> you also notice that when you keep reading the book of Job, his friends and his people, they're not all from one country, the land of Israel. They all come from different places. So then his friends came from different far places. And you can tell that these are tribal groups as well who came to visit Job and comfort him. And you'll see that in Job chapter 2. <clears throat> then when you read through the book of Job, you'll notice what's very interesting. It mentions uh, accounts not about the children of Israel or Egypt. Throughout uh, Job, the majority of the book of Job in your chapters... <clears throat> With the, most of the book, most of the chapters in the book of Job is discussion. It's about their own lectures, their own sermons. But throughout their own sermons, Moses is not mentioned or the history of the children of Israel, not even Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. And they are significant people in their history. So you would think that Job would mention that. So there's no doubt Job is a tribal group that time. What they do mention, though, is what? They do mention about a lot of scientific statements. Why? Because, we, I might cover this in our world history class, because what's very interesting is that what was the key pinnacle of scientific achievement during the ancient history? That's Genesis 5, Genesis 6. Remember, Noah's family lived in that timeline. And because of that, some of that knowledge was being carried out. If you read Genesis 10, look at the genealogy. The longevity was still there, but it was shrinking. It was fading. So their, no, their knowledge capability, their education, their technology and all that was also fading as well. That's why Job is filled with scientific statements in your Bible. Because it's carrying from that uh, Genesis account. That's why some people say that uh, the reason why the pyramids were possibly built even after the flood was because that knowledge was still carried. That knowledge was still carried because they still had the capability that time, which is pretty interesting. All right, so, and not only that, it will mention about Noah's flood, and it will even mention about the Lucifer, uh, Lucifer's flood as well, the pre-Adamic flood. So that's pretty interesting. So there's no doubt Job is definitely, has to be the oldest book in your Bible. Amen. All right, uh, next question. Sister Danielle. That one is kind of a follow-up to that. Why is it placed in the Bible where it is? Good question. The reason why is because in your Bible, it's set up in a premillennial order. Amen. That's why. So uh, if you, uh, let's look at Genesis, okay? If you look at Genesis, it's, it starts out with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, right? That's why Job's not the first. The reason why Job's not the first book in the Bible is because we're trying to look at a, a, the account of the beginning, in the beginning. God created the heaven and the earth. So we want to see what happened with our history at the beginning. <clears throat> but Job's account, when you read it, it is actually a lot of reflection of the account of the tribulation. You might say, really? Yeah, it does. Because it talks about a man who uh, went through affliction and suffering. And then questioning about God's ways. But you'll notice that the Lord, he allowed that affliction to fall upon Job. And you'll notice that the book of Job, nah, let's look at Job chapter, the last chapter of Job. Okay, let me show you a few verses, all right? Let me show you a few tribulation references. You ready? I'm going to show you a few tribulation references. <clears throat> let 
Look, look at the last chapter in the book of Job. And notice what the Bible says over here. Job is a great picture of the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, who have gone under captivity, but they've been restored. And when they're restored, they're doubly blessed. Amen. So Job's a great type, typology of that. Look at, look at the wording in your King James Bible. Look at the book of Job, chapter 42, and verse 10. And the Lord turned the what? Captivity of Job. You see that? Turn the captivity. Now look at the references in your Old Testament when it talks about turn the captivity. That's all, that phrase, turn the captivity, is all a tribulation reference <coughs> about the restoration of the nation of Israel. Uh, let's look at a couple verses over here. Dr. Upman also has a few written out over here. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. And we'll look at verse 23. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 23. Okay, so the next question then is why is Job mentioned in the latter book in your Bible? Because if this was started at the beginning, it wouldn't make sense when it has so many tribulation references. So a great place to put the book of Job is actually after, it's actually, uh, it's actually at a good place actually when you look at the book of Job. It should be placed after uh, Kings and Chronicles. You might say, why is that? Because Kings and Chronicles over here, when you look at uh, Second Chronicles, Nehemiah, Esther, and Ezra, the order goes like this. So, first of all, let's cross out Genesis, right? Why? Because Genesis is the beginning. So there's no way Job should go in here. It wouldn't make sense. doesn't look good. I mean, if you're the author of the Bible, if you're going to make your own book, you're going to have to admit that, nah, maybe Job wouldn't be a good place to start if I'm going to start a really cool reading. You have to take the mind of God that, how should I start a really good reading? Yeah. In the beginning. <laughs> wouldn't that be great? Amen. Yeah. As a matter of fact, even when I was attending class at Berkeley, they couldn't deny the language of the King James Bible Amen. that what a great place to start in the beginning. And they say, in the beginning, God, right next to it. Amen. They even mentioned, the Berkeley professor mentioned how the Hebrew scholars as well, they want to put God close to beginning as well to show that he is, like he's always there. And then you know what the Berkeley professor did after that? He criticized modern versions. That? He said that in Genesis 1-1, they just ruined the wording. And then everyone was praising the King James Bible. And I, that's when I woke up at class. <laughs> I was like, did I hear that right? Yeah. I was like, uh-huh. What? You know, like that. All right. Anyway, so that wouldn't make sense. Now, why would it be like after Second Chronicles, though? Because Second Chronicles, that's, uh, you know what that is? Second Chronicles is when Israel starts their captivity. They go to Babylon. Okay, then what does it do? Then from Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther... You see over here about the nation of Israel after their captivity, their restoration. Yes, sir. Esther is also rich with a lot of symbolism about Israel being uh, freed from the clutches of the Antichrist, actually. But we're not going to go over there. We're just covering the book of Job. So this was the time of the restoration of Israel. And then right after the restoration of Israel, we come to the book of Job. Why do we cover Job over here? Because Job, it can be a very good symbolic picture of the full account right here. So the author of your Bible had a, an intention in mind. His intention was, once you know the history of the children of Israel, then right over here, you can jump to the, you can see the full picture of their captivity and their restoration. But not only that, think about this, why would he put this before the book of Psalms? You know why? Because Psalms is a book of prophecy. And it is a prophecy filled with tribulation and restoration. But Job is obviously older than David and these writers. So it can be appropriate to put that, and it's also a historical account too. 
So we don't want to jump all the way to prophecy. You notice where prophecy is end times, right? Prophecy, do you know what books, what order of books in, the, in your Bible they're at? They're at the end. That's why Revelation is what? At the end. It's a book of prophecy. See that? So God wants to put prophetic books at a latter, latter order, history at an earlier order. Why? Because what men learn from history is that men never learn from history. He wants you to learn that. That way, when we hit prophecy, the future end times, you can see it unfold. You're getting a, a rich load uh, at our Bible studies lately where you're getting Genesis history account. And not only that, verse by verse revelation. History and prophecy is a rich load, gold mine, that you want to combine together. History and prophecy. You can learn so much out of both of them. But history is first because it's time about our history, past. Prophecy is later. Why? Because it's time about future. Whoever wrote, uh, whoever did the orders of your King James Bible, the books in your Bible, had to be a brilliant God. Amen. Okay, so this makes a lot of sense, but let's look at the following verses over here that can see some of the great pictures here about the book of Job, okay? So we looked at Jeremiah chapter 31, and then look at verse 23. Jeremiah 31, 23. Thus saith the Lord, Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as yet they shall use this speech in the land of Judah and the cities thereof, when I shall bring again their what? Captivity. The Lord bless thee, O habitation of justice and mountain of holiness. So notice uh, right here, verse 27. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow uh, the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man, and with the seed of beast, etc., etc. Notice right here, it's a future tribulation reference, right? Days come, future end times, apocalyptic. So the captivity, notice that the restoration of the nation of Israel is mentioned at verse 23. He's going to bring again their captivity. When will Israel be fully restored? It's not fully restored yet. They're still in conflict. They still have that Palestinian-Israel conflict going on. It's not going to be fully restored until the millennium. All right, look at several more verses. Look at chapter 33, chapter 33, verse 7. We're going to look at chapter 33, verse 7. Look at the language of your Bible about turning the captivity. And I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to what? Return and will what? Build them as at the first. See, restoration of the nation of Israel. Look at that. All right, we're going to look at, uh, nah, well, we're done, okay. So anyways, just look up that term, that term in the Bible, turn again the captivity. Look up that phrase. It's all the tribulation reference of the restoration of the nation of Israel. So notice that God, all the way at the beginning. I yes. Oh, no, no, I was like, wait, sorry. Everybody can look for the next question. Okay, the next question. Okay, the, sorry, sorry, I got a long way to go, brother. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going through the tribulation here, so give me a moment. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so endure unto the end, brother. Okay, so anyways. Um, oh, yeah, the restoration of the nation of Israel. You'll notice that God had that in mind then for the oldest book in your Bible mm -hmm. wow. during the time of Job. So if you have an anti-Semite mindset then, mm -hmm. then there's something wrong with you. If you try to go attack the nation of Israel and go off on them and say that these people are forever forsaken, they'll never be restored by God, you bet you're in trouble, actually. And I'd be scared if I were you because God's oldest book, he thought about that. You know why? During that time of Job, which is around the time of Abraham, you know what he was thinking? He was thinking, I'm going to have a people that I'm going to restore and I have this guy in my sights. So I'm going to start forming this people. That's what he was thinking that time. All righty. Um, also, I didn't look at all these other verses about tribulation references, but these include uh, Job chapter uh, 14, uh, verses 13 through 14. Actually, that's a great passage debunking the mid-trib or pre-wrath uh, pre rapture for the ch Christian church. So that's an excellent passage that talks about uh, avoiding uh, when the wrath is passed and then these people get their resurrection and their bodies changed, actually. Mm -hmm. So this is post-wrath, not pre-wrath, actually. So uh, that's one passage. Not only that, you can also use 
Job chapter 41. Job 41 talks about Leviathan. And Leviathan pops out at Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. That dragon comes out. And he is called Leviathan. How do you know that? Because you just compare that with the book of Isaiah. When you look at Isaiah chapter 27, I think, then it talks about Leviathan being compared to the dragon. And then uh, look at Job, how much he's pouring out his tribulation. Oh, yeah. And that's the greatest evidence. He went through a lot of tribulation. Tribulation means suffering, hardship. Mm. That whole chapter is about Job's tribulation. That should be undoubtable proof. Job, what did he receive? He got boils. Amen. Revelation chapter 16 talks about God sending the boils. See that source. So there's, a, there's rich in references over here. Rich in references.